Prostitution in the Roman Empire Today on Echoes Through Time, we will talk about prostitution in ancient Rome, where it was considered a necessary evil. Prostitution was legal and to practice it, one needed a mandatory license called licentia stupri, granted by the office of the Edal. It was only necessary to provide one's name, age, date of birth, and professional name. According to records from the year one, it is estimated that there were around 32,000 individuals practicing prostitution in the empire. Initially, they did not pay taxes, but this changed later when the law required them to pay 10% of their monthly income. By law, they were granted one holiday per year, but the truth is they had no rights whatsoever. They could not inherit, marry free Roman citizens, make a will, and in the case of having children, they had no rights either. Cato the Elder, a Roman politician, writer, and military leader declared, It's good that young people possessed by lust go to brothels instead of having to bother other men's wives. Meritrix was the name assigned to registered prostitutes, and prostibulae were the women who worked at the lowest rank of the profession. Another derogatory term used for these women was scordum. According to writings from the time, it was common for them to wear short male togas, blonde wigs or dye their hair. They were prohibited from concealing their identity and dressing and grooming like other women. As a curiosity, a little-known figure in ancient Rome was the Alipolarius, who were responsible for depilating pubic hair for both prostitutes and people from the upper classes, as Romans were not in favor of having pubic hair, and this habit started in adolescence for both men and women. It's needless to say that it was a difficult life. The price of prostitution was very low, so anyone could access these services, and in some cases, they were victims of sexual violence and frequently suffered severe infections. It is worth remembering that in ancient Rome, rape was a crime, but the law only punished the rape of a slave if it damaged the property of its owner since a slave had no legal capacity as a person and was considered only an object. The punishment aimed to financially compensate the owner for the damage to their property. The reasons why these women resorted to prostitution were diverse. In some cases, they were slaves, many of them kidnapped and sold. This was something that happened quite regularly in the Mediterranean. There, they were captured by pirates who sold them directly to brothels. This market was extensive and offered many benefits. Their owners prostituted them throughout the day. Another very common way to end up in prostitution was through the family. In the event that the head of the family fell seriously ill or died, many daughters ended up practicing prostitution by imposition of their own family, or voluntarily to try to support them economically. This shows the level of misery that many families had to face, as sometimes they had no other options to survive. These girls and boys would receive practically the same treatment as a slave, reaching the same level of degradation. The pimps who prostituted their children were called by legal codes patters lenones. In both cases, the figure of the pimp appeared, which in Rome was called lino if it was a man or lina if it was a woman. This figure was very similar to what still exists today. Their job was to profit from the work of prostitutes, offering protection and facilities for sexual activities to take place. Some writings from the time described the women as Wasted, emaciated, dirty, and sickly figures stand upright, almost naked, in front of their filthy cells, the entrance of which is barely covered by a remnant of a curtain. Nevertheless, there were also independent and free women who chose to practice prostitution. They were subjected to fewer pressures, but their lives were not particularly easy either. They did not have the protection of a man, so in many cases, they were easily assaulted by their clients. In these circumstances, they often ended up paying for their own security to men who acted as bodyguards. 
High-class prostitutes were those who enjoyed a better standard of living thanks to their relationships with people at the highest levels of Roman society. They even had contracts with their clients, ranging from hours to years. This provided them with a certain stability. In fact, the treatment of these prostitutes was completely different. Their clients called them amicae or delicatae. The purchasing power of prostitutes also divided them into different areas of the city. The richest ones were found in the Aventine, where some lived quite luxuriously. On the other hand, slave prostitutes, or those considered low class usually frequented the worst neighborhoods of the Tiberian city. Thus, Trastevere or Velabrum were the neighborhoods where these prostitutes gathered to offer their services. These neighborhoods were considered very dangerous, so venturing into them without a good escort when night fell was truly risky. But worse than these neighborhoods was Subura, which was the poorest of all, and where the harlots received the derogatory name of Meritriculae for being the cheapest of all the city's prostitutes. However, their area of influence was not limited to these areas alone. They could also be seen in large numbers in leisure areas such as theaters, amphitheaters, circuses, baths, inns, or taverns. Typically, prostitutes waited at the entrances because it was very common for clients to be interested in their services after or before the performance. There was even a classification of prostitutes, depending on where they practiced their work and their services. Here are some explanations. Delicate. Luxury prostitutes only accessible to the most powerful. Famose. Women who, without any need, due to their social position, engaged in sex for pure pleasure. Lupi. Those who practiced the trade in brothels. Noctiluke. Those who only worked at night. Copai. Those who worked in the Copona, a shop for quick drinks and cold meals, usually wine, cold cuts, cheeses, or pickles. Fornicatrices. Those who did it under the arches of bridges or buildings. The term fornix means arch, hence the word fornication. Foraria. Those who worked on rural roads near Rome, and their main clients were travelers. Bustuaria those who worked inside or near cemeteries. Prostibule, those who worked on the street without any control. But besides women, men also engaged in prostitution, albeit to a lesser extent, including some gladiators. They offered their services to both women and men, and like women, they also paid taxes. However, unlike women, they only worked for very high amounts. But there was legislation called Lex Santinio, which aimed to punish passive homosexuality, something frowned upon at the time. Within male prostitution, there were also different categories, some of them were Patici, passive male prostitutes, Mephebi, adolescent male prostitutes, Felators, prostitutes who only performed oral sex, Spadones. Their main characteristic was having a penis but no testicles. Amasi. They had the quality of practicing their trade during long sessions. Prostitution in the Roman Empire was an omnipresent reality that reflected the social and moral complexities of the time. This phenomenon challenges us to reflect on power and exploitation, both in the past and present.